Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marikita Solis, and this is We Did It Health, a beautiful event that I've been looking forward to. And at We Did It, we do these events because we want to create a happy, healthy, vegan, and plant based world. And we're doing that through building community and offering resources such as today's discussion to help you create relationships where you'll plant seeds of curiosity in others. And it, this is crucial because we've got to be ready when they ask about a vegan or plant-based lifestyle. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or, or check out the we did it dot health our page. And please answer the one question survey. We also have a Facebook community that you can connect with others and support vegan and plant-based ambassadors. So links to the group are in the description below. And I am, again, I'm Marikita Solis, and I'm so excited to welcome Gareth Skur of Vegan FTA to today's program. And everyone that's watching, please give StreamYard permission to use your name. And please put your questions in the comments for us and let's get started. So thank you so much, Gareth, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Well, you're in New Zealand, right? Yes, I am up bright and early here in New Zealand. It is uh, a brilliant 6 a.m. So I'm up with the uh, up with the birds this morning. <laughs> well, we're honored, honored to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, um, because I don't really know that much about vegan FTA. Uh, I, I mean, when I see your posts, they're amazing. It really touches my heart. So I know that it, you're really doing a lot of great work, touching people's heart and changing lives. So I'm going to let you let you educate us right <laughs> on vegan FTA and your work. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate it. And we, we do try our best, you know, to help educate people and let them know what, what's going on for the animals out there. And uh, for those who don't know, FTA is for the animals. And so that's what we do everything for. But so today, why do we love animals? Well, some animals and not others. So before, I, before we start, I'd like to share a rather timely true story, which happened just a couple of weeks ago where I live. In the small village I call home, our local community Facebook page, I'm sure everyone's village has one of these these days, it was just in a flurry of concerned activity after somebody posted a, a rather tragic post about something that was unfolding just around the corner. A small cat had been spotted in a state of distress with a fishing hook hanging from its mouth. Now, whether you're a cat person, an animal lover, a vegetarian, a pescatarian, a vegan, no, no matter who you are, it's hard to see such a thing happen and not feel for that animal. It's hard not to care when you see something like this happening. So upon sounding the alarm, our community quickly united and secured rescuers and a vet for the cat. <laughs> they did have to get the other mitts out to get hold of, hold of them. They were very feisty at the time and with uh, good reason. But um, they managed to get it help, you know, and whilst I can't say for certain what the outcome was, uh, it is hoped by everyone who was uh, dealing with it that it's now heading home um, after a visit to the vets. So in any small town or village, you know, a story like this doesn't just end there. It continues on in gossip and rumors. A couple of days later, we had a man working for the SPCA. Um, I'm not sure if you have that over in the States. Um, but the, the Society for Prevention of um, Cruelty to Animals, hence SPCA, because it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, and they were making uh, house calls to try and raise funds for the organization. And the tale of the little cat with the fish hook was still just the talk of the town. And so each time this man came and knocked on doors, he was retold the story again and again and again. By the time he'd reached us, he just skipped the story altogether. You know, I've heard this one and, and moved straight into the reactions instead. And in doing so, he mentioned something that really got me thinking about today's topic of why we love some animals and not others. The charity worker said that everyone was wondering whether it was just an accident or an act of cruelty. Surely it must be an accident. You know, we love cats. You know, surely no one do such a cruel thing to an animal. 
So questioning this, whether it is indeed a deliberate act or, a, you know, just an accident, it really stuck with me. And it's a question I'd like to explore at the end of this today. Um, so please keep it in mind as we go through the presentation, because we'll come back to it, whether this can just be an accident or an act of cruelty. So let's get into it. Why do we love some animals and not others? Well, the majority of us have never even thought to ask ourselves that question before. But deep down, I know we already have the answer inside of us. Throughout this presentation, I aim to help you find your answer by looking at the role your beliefs play and how it affects your choices, where those beliefs come from and how we can make more informed decisions of why we might love some animals and not others. To begin properly, I'd like to share a quote from globally renowned peace educator Prem Rawat, which I feel is very apt for today's discussion. And I must say, I loved at the start of this, you saying about uh, sowing the seeds of curiosity, because it works very well into this. So the quote goes, we're each given seeds. There is a seed of anger and a seed of kindness. There is a seed of love and a seed of hate. There is a seed of understanding and a seed of confusion. How restful it will be in your garden of life depends on what seeds you sow. I love me a good seed metaphor, as you will find out during this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the freedom and the power to make choices. And these daily choices affect the well-being of ourselves, the animals, and our planet. But every choice we make is rooted in a belief. And much like the seeds of anger, kindness, love, and hate, our beliefs stem from the seeds we plant, whether it be consciously or unconsciously. For anyone who has stopped to consider today's question, you may be familiar with the term speciesism. So what is speciesism? Speciesism is the human-held belief that all other animal species are inferior. Speciesist thinking involves considering animals who have their own desires, needs, and complex lives as a means to human ends. This notion was first introduced by English philosopher, philosopher Richard Ryder in the 1970s. 6 <laughs> a.m. stumbles. <laughs> um, and subsequent, pop, subsequently popularized by Australian philosopher Peter Singer. Ryder, Singer, and other opponents of speciesism have claimed that it's exactly analogous to racism, sexism, and other forms of irrational discrimination and prejudice. All things considered, this is a, an extremely noxious plant to have grown in our garden of life, don't you think? So how, how does it get there? Some of you may already be familiar with the, uh, the acclaimed advocate and author, Dr. Melanie Joy. And in 2001, Dr. Joy's extensive studies into the psychology of food led her to ask that same question that we ask today uh, through her groundbreaking book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. It's a brilliant title, isn't it? Um, her question to this, well, her answer to this question is the deep-seated belief system called Carnism, a belief system so widespread that its principles and practices are just considered common sense. Who here grew up thinking that a meal wasn't complete without meat? I definitely did. Who felt that becoming vegetarian was a choice, whereas eating meat was just normal? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do anything. Like you had to be mad to go vegetarian. That's how I, I grew up. You know, like it's a, it's a huge choice. So carnism is this invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals, and it's just so prevalent that yeah, we don't even consider it a choice. Most people, like myself, used to consider it a necessity. So through the seeds of carnism, we can also grow that speciesism. We see compassionate, good-natured, and gentle people living under this belief system, people filled with kindness and love, adhering to this system of serious violence and oppression because they're told this is the way we are as humans. You know, M Most of my life, I had no idea I held this belief. I had no idea I was even making that choice. Like the other seeds, these belief systems are sown into us the moment we are born. And they grow throughout our lifetime. 
ready to pass down to the next generation. With each subsequent generation, it grows more and more resilient, removing space for anything else to grow. Our mammoth hunting ancestors, they, they may have needed to sow this seed out of survival, but despite the fact that we've been able to live for, for decades now in a thriving state, Brad in accounting still thinks he needs to be an apex predator while he unwraps his hamburger from the canteen and sits in his office cubicle far, far removed from nature. <laughs> Why? <laughs> This seed, the seed of carnism and speciesism, is the reason why we love some animals and not others. It's this joint belief that keeps us held in this system. And so where where do we get this from? Who Who is giving us this, this, this seed to grow and who is watering it? So... It's been a very interesting process writing this and, you know, taking that moment to look back within. And so together, I'd like to take a moment to go inwards and sort of start to see where these seeds have come from. You know, how have they been passed down? You know, for us, our families, think back to who raised you. What did a normal meal look like in your household? Did your parents or grandparents, did they hunt or fish to put food on the table? Did you have animals raised in, in the backyard for food, be it a few chickens running around, uh, a pig in the barn? Were there cultural or religious beliefs that dictated some of the things you did or didn't eat? Most importantly, what aspects of that do you carry on today? What seeds are you watering in your garden? You know, as I say, it's been a, a fantastic, uh, fascinating and enlightening exercise for me doing this. And going back to my answers to these questions. So in my case, I was lucky to grow up in a tiny little village called Bulch. Um, very tricky for um, overseas people to say, uh, being Welsh, it's B-W-L-C-H, a Bulch. <laughs> this lovely little village that was just, you know, surrounded by lush green fields, stretch out across the hills, where animals would graze peacefully, or at least until uh, us local children got let out of school and uh, let loose to play in those fields. And, you know, I was raised with my brother just just by my mum, and we had frequent visits from our pop-pop, uh, who we call our, our granddad in our family. And a key family value for us was self-reliance. We were taught to be capable of fending for ourselves from an early age, just in case anything ever happened. And so that's one seed that was passed down to me that I was very grateful to have, having that self-reliance. But family meals for us were meat and three veg, or meat and two veg, or meat and one veg. <laughs> it wasn't a meal without meat. We followed a lot of British traditions, such as the Sunday roast dinners, which were full of wonderful veg vegetables, but all just around this dead centerpiece. Or whatever that was that week, it was beef, pork, or chicken, it, it always had to have that at the center. And as I say, Pop Pop, he used to come visit us often, and he was French, and so he instilled his, his culture and his deep love of, stereotypically, love of cheese, meats like saucisson, a type of dry-cured sausage, garlic, and wine. <laughs> Even <laughs> though we couldn't drink at that age, you know, it, it was always instilled to us that that, that was the, the the greatest of beverage you know and so pop pop was always a big advocate of you know every meal could be made better with cheese he had this wonderful habit i i found it so amusing as a child um of pouring a splash of his wine into his soup <laughs> and then he would get and start grating cheese or this big mound of cheese on the top and start stirring it all in <laughs> with a chuckle you'd always just be it all goes to the same place doesn't it you know and <laughs> it was just one of those aspects and you know for me that's still a fond memory but i can see you know that the way of consumption was something that was being passed down to me and as we as i asked you know about you know our parents grandparents fishing or hunting my granddad was a fly fisherman you know my uncle worked in a chicken and uh, turkey processing plant processing to be um, <laughs> the euthanism of it. Um, but he didn't talk about it much. Mum had previously worked in a store preparing fine meats. Of course, most of those came straight from the source, straight from the animal. 
we weren't physically disconnected from the practice of killing animals in our family, but we still managed to disconnect the product from the animal itself due to this carnist belief that we unconsciously followed. So we weren't a religious family. We didn't have that sort of doctrine in the household, but the local school was. And each day before lessons, we'd start with an assembly. And uh, this is where we'd come together and we sang hymns. I think it's quite stereotypical of Welsh people as well. We start our day with singing. Um, one such hymn was All Things Bright and Beautiful, All Creatures Great and Small. And through our enthusiastic singing, um, some might say, especially in my case, bellowing, uh, we were taught that Lord God made them all. However, it didn't say we had to love them all. Through the Bible, I did learn one thing about food, though. You could feed a surprising amount of people from a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread. You know, was... <laughs> I was thinking, why don't we have more bread and fish in the world at that stage? And so all of these elements of my life were just sowing these seeds, some good, some bad, but almost all of them, as we can see, were watering the seeds of carnism and speciesism. speciesism. And after getting home from school, even, some of my favorite childhood memories, once again, is sitting with my pop pop. And we'd watch David Attenborough documentaries religiously. And we're being introduced to all the marvels of nature and everything that we need to be protecting, you know, for the future generations. Learning about hundreds of species um, that, you know, I just fell in love with. Although, as a rule, these documentaries, they only ever sort of focused on endangered or at-risk animals affected by changes in their ecosystems or the encroachment of poachers. This precious TV time would often come after we just had a gloriously big meal, often Sunday roast. So together we were sitting there watering the seed of carnism, first eating some animals and then loving others. The irony of this just never entered my head at the time. After all, like the cows um, weren't at risk of melting ice caps, at least not the ones behind my house. You know, the pigs weren't at risk of poachers in the Welsh countryside. And the chickens didn't have to worry about trying to find food in a failing ecosystem when they were packed in barns. They weren't the stars of Blue Planet or Planet Earth, one of these great series. So even when I think about how um, through my education, like none of my teachers at any stage ever made any mention of how we should treat animals. Our school trips were taught teaching us about the wonderful creatures that lived in zoos and aquariums, but never about who was in our sandwiches. Three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, these animals were just food. And this is because it is all around us. It is all consuming. And it's not just the lessons our parents impart on us. It's not just the hymns that we sang or wailed in school or the man on the television. Carnism, carnism is a seed that grows everywhere. If you switch on your TV, I challenge you. Now, this, this is quite a fun game, actually. I challenge you to count the number of times consuming animal products comes up in just a half an hour time slot. It, it is amazing. Um, you will be blown away by just how much it comes up because my wife and I did a really interesting experiment. Well, interesting to us anyway, not so long ago um, where we went for a walk and I took one of those uh, click counters. You see like in sports, you know, to count how many repetitions or whatever it is, you know, and we, we went for a walk through our local neighborhood and past the shops, our, our daily route. And every time we saw an ad, ad advertisement for an animal product, we'd press the clicker. And when we walked past the fishing supply shop, click again. If we saw a sign for an app, like upcoming um, horse race, of course, another use of animals, we'd click it again. And in this very short walk, maybe 30, 45 minutes at most, and sticking to our usual route, no detours, we weren't looking for every, anything, we counted well over 60 posters and businesses all just dedicated to the ideals of carnism and speciesism and that's just you know going for our usual walk our usual route we weren't aiming to find anything it's just what happened in front of us in just a small space and it just blows blows me away because you know cows they're labeled as beef pigs pork chicken 
nuggets. It's hard to see them as the animals they really are. The seeds of speciesism and carnism have redirected our love to products rather than the beings that they're removed from. You know, and we quite often say as, as vegans, you can't love animals and eat them too. But sadly, we have grown a garden in which many can. And it is weird for sure. Like, but in a world where the dominant belief system says it's okay to eat certain animals and it's just so prevalent, it's not even considered a choice. People don't see the difference between love and consumption. And as the classics children's story, where the wild things are, would say, we'll eat you up. We love you so. Except the children's story isn't real. Carnism, sadly, is very real. So when you open your eyes to it, it's incredible how much we are being sold this belief system every day. No wonder we don't consider it a choice. The belief system that drives our ability to love some animals and not others is passed down to us by our family, taught in our schools, seen on our TV sets. It's, engaged, it's ingrained in our communities and our cultures. It's a seed we're given on a daily basis without even being conscious to it most of the time. We plant it again and again in our gardens. But there is a way out. I, I truly believe that there, there has been a time in all of our lives where we've been conscious to it, even if we didn't know what it was at the time. And I feel I can speak for most people right now in saying that we do not wish to willingly cause suffering to others. We, we just don't, we just try and do what we know is right. The issue is what we're being told is right or wrong doesn't adhere to that, that feeling. So we need to decide this for ourselves. And how can we do that? Connecting with individuals from another species is, is such an important way to do this. Animal ambassadors. They come into our lives and give us opportunities to recognize and see what we've been contributing to or previously been uh, a part of. Many people follow animal sanctuaries and see the, the warm, fuzzy stories um, of animals being saved from slaughter. And this is a great place to start. This is a great way of understanding that there is somebody behind the body part on the plate. But something I feel is more powerful to any individual is their own personal interactions with animals. As somebody who was previously dead set against the idea of, of, of not eating animals, um, seeing clips like that on the internet, it wasn't enough to uproot carnism with me, within me. I really had to go inwards and revisit my individual interactions with animals. And so um, being raised in a small rural village and the idea of being self-sufficient so key to our family, I grew up with the ideals of homesteading. Dream of one day owning my own plot of land with animals kept for a purpose. I idolized people like the British uh, chef and TV personality Hugh Fernley Whittingstall for the, ho the wholesome lifestyle he promoted and connection to the earth and animals it utilized. I felt like I would surely be a better meat eater by becoming a homesteader. And so the first step to that was learning how to catch and kill my own food. And so my mother taught me, having worked in the fine food industry, uh, mum knew what to do with rabbits. And so she, she took me up the hills and taught me how to catch them as a young teenager. Um, we used snare traps, a, a thin wire noose designed to catch rabbits by the neck and hold them until they're retrieved. More often than not, the rabbits would be dead by the time I arrived, having choked whilst trying to escape the wire. Any survivors would swiftly be, well, have their necks broken in a violent twist and pull motion. I apologize if this is hard to hear. If it sounds brutal, it's because it was. It, it wasn't until the introduction and spread of mixed mitosis, however, that I began to question the brutality I was involved with. So mixed mitosis is a, a horrific disease which affects rabbits and is commonly used in the UK for pest control. I can still see, you know, that, that first encounter I had with it. I walked up our usual trail to find half a dozen rabbits sitting out there in the middle of a field, soaking up the sun. 
And I was joined that day by an older hunter. And upon seeing the rabbits, he just strode straight off, straight towards them, uttering something under his breath. And I could not believe it that he could just walk up to these rabbits that way. For me, I'd spent weeks as a kid trying to get close, crawling and <laughs> literally on my belly, crawling up the hill to try and get anywhere remotely close to these rabbits. But he could just walk straight up to them. And standing over one of the rabbits, he raised the heel of his boot and crushed his head, killing it instantly. And in that moment, I, I'm still ashamed to this day to say that I laughed. I just couldn't believe what I'd just seen. It just seemed so unreal. But, you know, my companion soon explained to me the sobering truth of why he'd committed such a, a callous act. The disease infecting these rabbits would cause the swelling of eyes, skin lesions, tumors, and ultimately a long and painful death to those who contracted it. Those rabbits I saw sitting in the sun were the first of many deliberately made to go blind, deaf, and be slowly asphyxiated by these tumors. And what started out as hunting trips, you know, to provide food for the family and sort of um, give me that step into that wholesome lifestyle, it turned into mercy missions. It, it, and it wasn't long before I, I couldn't take any more of it. Going up there with rabbits blindly straying from the burrows, disease, death, shivering, and waiting their death, waiting for that death to come. It was it was during that tea, <laughs> during that time that the seed of carnism started to shrivel in me. I knew things weren't right. The rabbits didn't need to suffer. My days as a mighty rabbit hunter, you know, I'd come to an abrupt end and I, I vowed not to eat another. I just couldn't take that suffering that I was seeing. Shortly after my family emigrated to New Zealand and upon seeing the photos of my rabbit catching days uh, back in Wales, my new school friends were just absolutely horrified by this. And they would ask me, how could you eat cute little bunnies? And I would tell them, plain and simple, there is no difference between that fluffy bunny and the cow on your plate. <laughs> and while I was speaking the truth, you know, in practice, I was a hypocrite looking back. Here I was advocating it made no difference between species, yet I no longer chose to eat one of them. And it's just, <laughs> it's bizarre thinking about it back thinking about it now you know but when i hunted there was this common rhetoric uh and i'm sure many of you would have heard it today you know around eating wild animals which is at least they had happy lives at least they had their freedom they were just unlucky to get caught and so on and so forth you know we distort our perceptions so wildly to justify this and it, it got me thinking about that same scenario in human terms what if you and I were, were, were standing uh, on the sidewalk together, having, we were, we're smiling, we're chatting, we're having a, a wonderful time. And then out of the blue, the car hits the curb, comes over and flattens me into a paste. Would my death be any better because I was happy at the time? I was standing there by my free will. Does the joy in my life not leave a bigger pit of sadness? <laughs> would the fact I was happy up until that moment not mean it's a more tragic loss? It's, it's funny when we think of it in human terms, isn't it? But, you know, if I was suicidal that time, someone might say, at least he is at peace now. At least he isn't suffering anymore. And I know that justification from the loss of my own friends. And, you know, it's, I'm not saying that we should make animals depressed in order to eat them. No, they're not completely not. But to me, it just highlights how much people like myself used to use welfare conditions to justify my consumption. In reality, the suffering of a chicken, whether it be caged or free range, that suffering cannot be quantified by us. We cannot feel what they feel, but we can recognize that they suffer regardless of the conditions when we take their lives. But if an action needs justification, is it something we should be participating in every day you know that that's the big thing for me one group of animals that many of us don't even bother justifying consuming is fishes um another thing how many people here were taught fish don't feel pain or fish don't have memories 
<laughs> I, I joined the group in that one, you know, because I believe those missed most of my life. And once again, once I'd emigrated to New Zealand, my mother got into ocean fishing. My granddad had been a fly fisherman. So the seed gets passed down and we were living closer to the sea. And so it was her turn to provide for the family in the same way. And this created family bonding time, just as my granddad had done with his fishing trips. And I was well into my teens at this stage, and I'd be lying to say, lying if I said that there wasn't a rush of adrenaline when some unknown creature down in the murky depths of the ocean suddenly grabs hold of your line, and you're holding on desperately, reeling it in, trying to see if this, if this mystery monster is going to match what's in your head, this mighty beast I've pictured. And most of the time, for me, in my case, they got away. All those that did come up were just feisty small fish. And I'm sure any anybody who's been fishing here can actually relate to that. <laughs> but I remember th this one trip so vividly because we were catching red gurnard. I, I absolutely fell in love with this species there and then. I was enchanted by their red scales and the scallop shape of their fins. Uh, they, the fins have this beautiful hue of green with this sort of light blue border to it, which it just stood out in such contrast to the red bodies. And, you know, as I reeled one in and I got close to the surface, I could see it in all its glory. And there's that magical thing when the sun hits the top of the water, like especially out in the ocean, and you can see these golden globes sort of dancing on the water's edge. And in that moment, I was reeling the line up and this beautiful, vibrant creature just flashed through the orbs. Its scales reflecting the light and the bright colors were just shimmering underneath the surface. It, it was a magical moment. And so I pulled it up, I heaved on board the boat, and this stunning, graceful creature gave out this large, nasally grunt. It's sort of like a ha sort of noise. <laughs> it's very hard to replicate, but I thought it was the most comical thing at the time. Once again, you know, I just, I thought this, this was a wonderful noise, and I declared the, the gurn in my favorite fish. But the longer it is on board, the more you could see the vivid colors start to fade. Those beautiful green and blue fins turned a dark gray and the grunts no longer seem funny anymore there, there was something something was wrong as a 16 year old i didn't think to question it back then you know but in the back of my head just like with the rabbits there was there was something telling me that some this was this was wrong if it was my favorite fish if i loved it why had i just murdered it why because i'd learned this belief from my family this was all part of having the wholesome life spending time together ensuring we're fed I wasn't at ease with it, though. I didn't feel fishing was conducive to good health, especially for me with my light skin, sitting on a boat, getting sunburned, waiting for some unknown creature to bite. We spent plenty of time together as a family, and worse yet, I, I didn't even like eating fish. You know, the, the fish that we caught, I, I hated eating them, <laughs> much less ramming a spike through its head to kill it, disemboweling it, and filleting it, deboning, all the gruesome stuff. So... That was in one moment where, once again, I decided to stop. I decided to stop fishing. It wasn't long after that. And, you know, I just, I couldn't live with the idea. It was just so unfair of me to catch what I did not want to eat, you know. And the idea of doing the catch and release, like many do, they stop eating fish, they start doing catch and release, just seemed cruel because I was doing the same act to them, you know. And I did return to it briefly for a couple of years, David, um, I did return to it very briefly. It was a couple of years down the track and it just, it did not stick because I, I just, I remembered that cruelty in it. And it's only through having some of these, you know, and I'm sorry to share such sort of some of the barbaric things that I've done, but through seeing uh, this suffering being experienced as a direct result of my own actions, I was able to see past the belief of carnism in these instances. And it's not comfortable for me to go back to these things. It's a hard thing to sort of bring up for me. But it's in these places that I can see the most damage that I was doing. And, you know, this, the fishing trip and the rabbits were just a couple of experiences in my life where I discovered that I didn't want to conform to how others acted, how they thought and what they believed. I was me. I am me. I'm I'm Gareth. <laughs> I wanted to plant my own seeds. I wanted to grow my own garden, to use our extended metaphor. You know, although at that stage, don't go thinking I went vegan after that. Oh, no. There, there's a much 
there's only one small piece of the puzzle. There was a much bigger um, thing to look at. You know, the, the bigger picture was a way, way off there. But this is the thing in this in this community, in this culture, in this everything around us harnessing that canism and speciesism, we just continue on in life, not recognizing the other suffering, not understanding the other situations of cruelty in our everyday lives. And so I carried on as a canis for, for a long time after that, even more so eating some, while loving others and i was recently told um many people go through life viewing success as the avoidance of suffering and this was something true to me for many a year i avoided things so i would stay intact not have to confront anything or anyone not to have to change the life i was comfortable with i succeeded in that i was content because, you know, something much harder to do is to challenge these beliefs, you know, to look back on these things, to realize the seemingly little things that were that we were doing that causing suffering to others, especially when again and again, we're told that it's OK, it's normal. It's our belief system, you know, and when this does happen, you know, if we do go and question it, the, the response we get time and time again is this is the way we have always done it. And it occurred to me, who is the we? When we decided this, were you and I involved in this decision? Or did we just accept what we had passed down to us? As, as many of us, you know, I did this for, for so long, for most of my life. You know, we're taught to trust the experts, uh, those in authorities and those who are certified by our current society. We are told to listen to wise men to gain wisdom. But the only way to truly be wise is to listen to ourselves. We have to ask, you know, are these beliefs my own? The ways we have always done things have to be questioned or else we risk making the same mistakes. Imagine this scenario. So you pay a visit to your, your local health practice practitioner just for a checkup, you know, nothing to worry about, nothing, don't stress, don't stress anyone. And your name is called by the receptionist. Well, at least you think it was, you do the same thing I think all of us do where we start mouthing our name back to the receptionist, nodding and sort of quizzically looking at them. I'm, I think I'm Gareth. Yes, I'm Gareth. I'm Gareth. I'll, I'll go in, shall I? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you get past that whole awkward scenario. And you go in, the door's open, the doctor's sitting there, and he gestures to the chair at the end of his desk, and you sit down and they announce, you know, now, I see you haven't been smoking, but don't worry, I can prescribe you a pack now. <laughs> You'd be shocked, wouldn't you? You know, cigarettes. Why should I be smoking those, you know? In today's society, it sounds preposterous to imagine that our trusted, respected family doctors were also once the poster boys for cigarettes and actually recommended them to patients but this was the the belief sown into patients and con, uh, and consumers back in the 1930s to 50s which actually it wasn't too long ago and nobody questioned it you know enough time has now passed though that you know enough humans have died that we know it's not good for us you know despite it being the done thing for a long time we as a society saw this and recognized the suffering in our own species and successfully changed that belief to now the complete opposite, which I'm very happy to hear. So then why do we still eat animals and not others? Have not enough people died from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, other forms of cancer as a result of eating animals for us to realize it's bad for our health, you know? Have not enough pigs, sheep, cows, chickens, fishes died yet for us to realize how bad it is for them or the planet? I think it comes down to it's just easier, it's simpler to just ignore the suffering of other sentient beings, to stick to our current belief systems. So many of us, it's just, it's easy to be successful in avoiding suffering. But maybe if we billowed smoke every time we ate a sausage, maybe we might see the immediate danger. If every time we ate an animal, we coughed up like, like someone who's been smoking 40 cigarettes a day, perhaps we might recognize that there is suffering involved in that meal. Maybe if we just didn't pull the shutters down so hard to protect ourselves 
from opposing the status quo, we might des decide that these seeds that are planted are not our own. I've been fortunate in my life to have so many encounters with wildlife, which would ultimately uproot my beliefs. I'd always sworn as a teenager, as I said before, that there was no way in hell I was ever going to go vegetarian, let alone vegan. I was a meathead, a cheeseaholic. That, that was how I identified, especially as a teenager. And, you know, the thing is, it takes so many little pieces to come together. And not all the encounters that I had were acts of cruelty. There have been times where I've met an insect or a bird, and there's just been a semblance of understanding between us. I'd be interested, actually, to know if other people can relate to this. Having that moment where your eyes meet with a wild animal and the world just goes quiet for a second and you're just seeing each other just as animals in this shared space, whether it's on the walking trail, in your garden, or in my case, I actually had this one time with a praying mantis in the Subway sandwich shop. <laughs> well, that was an experience, you know. And all of these interactions, they all just help us define what our internal garden is. And it may just be a very small action that waters one seed. Or it can be a moment that helps us to remove some of those weeds, some of those noxious plants that have grown. So for me to sort of sum up all of this, you know, the ans my answer to why we love some animals and not others is the beliefs in which have been planted for us and our choosing to follow them blindly, to not recognize what it is we are a part of. The best resolution to this, if you want to change, is to question yourself and think back to your experiences with animals like I've done with myself. Look to your own true opinion on whether you love animals or not. Whether you do or not, that is up to you. You know your answer deep down. But I ask you, please, don't live in anybody else's garden. You have to grow your own. And so another thing that was shared by Prem was um, Prem Rawa was that the most divine gift that any of us have is the gift of breath. Our lives start with an inhale and they end with an exhale. Without breath, we have nothing. And so this is something we must cherish. How many of us here today share our homes with our homes, our lives, our families with a with an animal of another species, a, a dog maybe or a, or a cat? I must say, while the smell might not always be magical, it is comforting to have your dog gently panting by your side or the contented hum of a purring cat. Watching them sleep, often in ungodly positions, we see their chests rise and fall with the gift of breath. And this is something that never fails to make me smile. Even talking about it right now is getting me smiling. Um, for many people, that is as close as, as they may get to another species. But if we can make this connection, we have the ability to love more than just ourselves, just our own species. It's easy to forget the things that we're grateful for, like our own breath and the breath of every creature we share this world with. I was too late for that grunt, that gasping of breath from that gurnard. The sound of my actions taking that gift from another or because I was taught it was okay to eat, I didn't recognize it suffering. But now I do. I now see my beliefs were not my own. And from now on, the garden that I keep inside is going to be free from those poisonous, noxious, horrible, weedy plants such as carnism and speciesism. So to wrap up, um, as, as promised, we return to that, uh, that question at the start of today's talk about the little cat with the fishing hook and, and revisit it. You know, this distressing scenario, was it just an accident or an act of cruelty? Having gone through this now and recognizing that, you know, we are conditioned to view animals as a means to human ends and it's okay to eat certain animals, you know, are we able to justify that this was a mere accident? Now, my answer to this in my eyes is no. Seeing carnism and speciesism, this, this action the cat may not have been the intended target of that hook, but it fell victim to the cruelty and vision for the for another. You know, that red gurnard swimming peacefully in the natural habitat is just as, as capable experiencing suffering as that cat. So speciesism has conditioned us to think that 
you know, it's okay to put these things out there to harm one and not the other. And if you reject that, that ideology, that belief system, it can be nothing else but cruelty. And so I hope through this, you know, you've all learned a little bit about speciesism and carnism and a bit about a mad Welsh person, myself. <laughs> I, and it'll help you to define what's in your internal garden, what seeds you want to grow and see how you can progress forward. And so, um, yeah, th thank you for listening. That was beautiful. Yeah, there were so many wonderful points you made. And it really it helps me to understand people on their journey, too. I mean, I was there, too. I mean, I remember in college, I adopted a dog. And then I just ended up leaving him with the neighbors because I was very young at the time. And it's something that mm -hmm. just really has haunted me, and like that poor dog. And I had to just forgive myself for that. Because, I mean, I was in college. And this is not justification of course i just was thinking about other things right i wasn't as mature and i wasn't as sure i was kind and i loved animals but i didn't get it right i didn't value that dog and so yeah and it's it's wonderful when we can look back at those those are experiences that that brought us to where we are today and so those are mm. very beautiful that you shared gareth and that's what heather said thank you for being vulnerable and sharing it's tough so things it's one of the big things like so for us at vegan fda a large focus of ours is animal advocacy and becoming better animal rights activists and something we often forget when we're advocating with people is that their experiences like i had you know we've all been on that big path like you have with your dog you know we've all had these experiences where you know we've made mistakes we've done things that don't align with who we are now but we've got to remember that for me, I came a long way. As I said, I was a meathead, a cheeseaholic. I was never going to be vegan, you know, but I managed to make that change. And what I found through activism and advocating is that the more that we can be open, be vulnerable to people, the more we can speak about our own past experiences where we weren't as compassionate and kind as we once were, the more we can start to relate with others who are on that journey, who are all only midway. You know, but if we constantly say you've got to meet this bar straight off the bat, it's very hard to make that jump, you know. But if we can talk them up to there, it's amazing how many people in our lives around us who have gone vegan because, you know, we've been able to share the non-vegan things that we did that have led to the moments we have now. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much for, for listening today, Heather. And, um, yeah, I appreciate it. Well, Gareth, so tell me exactly about Vegan FDA. What do you do in the in your role there? So uh, currently I'm the creative director of Vegan FDA and also chief uh, interviewer and all sort of uh, all sort of those roles. We do a lot of content production. So Vegan FDA is a platform for vegans and vegan activists. And it's where you can really see what's going on. Our goal is actually to, to get non-vegans as well, I, I must say. Um, and so there we share what's really going on out there. There are so many battles being fought right now. There's so many brilliant activists out there doing great work through the interviews that I conduct myself. We have a big focus. Uh, we have an activist series, uh, which you can find on YouTube where we try and talk to a lot of grassroots activists who are making huge difference and trying to learn from them how we each, uh, me, each individual ourselves can um, become a better activist, become a louder voice for the animals. Our platform is there to give the animals a voice. And so we hope to empower the people who join us there in becoming a, a loudspeaker for that, you know, and, don't ever think that activism is only going out on the street with a placard or yelling at somebody. <laughs> it's not. It's doing things like this today, doing interviews, uh, speaking to people, having honest and open conversations, putting out artwork, uh, investing. There's so many different ways that we can advocate for the world we wish to see. There's so many possibilities to build a more compassionate world. You just got to be open to them. And so... Our hope at Vegan FTA is that we're, we're allowing people to see that and that there are so many ways that we can help animals because not all of us are capable of being out there in the street. Um, for, 
you know, for, for our, my, my situation, you know, um, we've had to deal with a lot of chronic health issues, um, in, in our sort of family. And it means that we can't go out all the time. It means that we're not able to make it to events and protests, but it doesn't mean we're any less activists because, well, to be honest, we spend too many hours on the internet trying to get more people there, get the word out, you know, but with our limited capabilities, you know, we're doing the best that we can to help others. And by the others, I mean, uh, non-human and human animals, you know, it, it's a joint world. And so, yeah, we do all, all sorts of vegan FDA, um, but join us, please. Um, we, we try to host as much fantastic content as we can and try to educate as, as best we can of, of how you can empower yourself to be that voice for the animals. Where do you find vegan FTA? Uh, what's the, where do we sign up? Uh, so uh, we have our Facebook page, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, and YouTube. And you can find us at uh, just vegan FTA. Um, I can try and stick a link uh, in, in the comments if you like, or send one through to you. Um, okay. But yeah, like, so we're all over uh, social media platforms. And I believe now we're getting close to 2 million followers. And so um, it's been a, a very exciting process for us getting so many people behind that message of compassion towards animals. And so it, we're really hopeful that we're going to just keep growing and getting more people on board. Because as I said earlier, I think most of us can say that, you know, we don't want to harm animals. We don't want to, um, we don't want to willingly contribute to suffering. And so it's just getting people to, to acknowledge that. And sorry, I'm just trying to find the link right now. Oh, I'll send you okay. to the Facebook page. Um, okay. Yeah. All good. And so definitely. And, and even if you can't get the link up there, I think we can find you no matter what. Yeah. And <laughs> let me show a quote. We got a question here. So many people, Susan says, so many people have no idea where their food comes from. Isn't it more difficult now for them to make a connection? Mm, it's kind of it's interesting with that because um I, I love that question because for me you know like i had the connection with the killing um growing up and so i found that um almost hard to overcome i found a lot of people i meet who have no idea where their food came from if you can get the education in front of them in uh, as i say in a way that is compassionate towards them in a way that um you know, you're not trying to just shove it in front of them. You, you work them up to it. They're a lot more sort of receptive because their minds are just blown by the the scale of cruelty there. For me, I've actually found it slightly more difficult, you know, when advocating with those people like myself who have been part of that process because for me, since I've been part of it, since I'd done those actions myself, I had much more justification in doing that, you know, I, I had justified it so much to myself. I'd, I'd warp that cognitive dissonance around it um, to to make it so that I was able to continue for so many years. And so that's where the, the trouble lies for me. But once again, if we're open, we're honest, we're vulnerable, and we have these discussions with people, they can make the change. I made the change despite swearing against it. So, <laughs> you know, it's possible. And yeah, it, it is difficult. Like the, the food industry really does hide it you know when we look at um the role of ag animal agriculture in our governments um the the food industries in our government the the, the biggest corporations and the biggest amount of dollars being spent anywhere is in these industries that um proliferate carnism and speciesism it is a very tough battle to get that information out there but you know have open honest conversations <laughs> we can get through to them yeah, that's very true. Um, um, if if you can't get through to them, someone else can, right? Maybe you're not the right person, but you know, if we all send them our together, way, right? We'll get them. <laughs> them. Okay, then we don't have to worry about that. All right. <laughs> what about? Let me ask you this. What about like your extended family? Are there some that think y'all are crazy, or what? Are they? Are they how does that go? <laughs> well, my brother at the moment he knows me as a zealous vegan which to be honest, I'm quite proud of. <laughs> um, but my mum, who, you know, featured in, in, in the, these stories, you know, um, I love my mum. She's such a strong individual and she, I, you know, we may have been raised to, to eat meat, but, you know, she really did her best with raising me and my brother. 
But, you know, when I first went vegan, um, she would, I put up photos. We were with um, a couple of little lambs. Uh, we were living on a, Jackie, my wife and I, we were living on a working sheep farm at the time. Um, and we were in a little camper van and that's, they sort of had a campground slash working sheep farm. And so we were staying there when we decided to make the choice to go vegan. And so the uh, local farmer there, he saw, oh, well, these are a couple of soft touches now, you know, like uh, they, they've just gone all vegan and soft. And so uh, they had lambs at the time and we got volunteered as the feeders for these orphan lambs. And we, uh, Jackie and I, we named them Casper and Dudley. And uh, <laughs> for, for any punk fans out there, Dudley was uh, named after the Jesus Lizard song, uh, Here Comes Dudley. But um yeah, we had these two lambs that were sort of brought into our lives. And, you know, they, they were some of the, I should have really spoke about them before. They were some of the early animal ambassadors for me that got me to realize just how how smart they were. We had a small dog at the time as well. And so we'd go for walks with our dog and the sheep would follow too. And when it came time to, we rescued, sadly, Dudley passed away suddenly. Um, but Casper managed to, he lived on and we we got him off the farm and took him to a sanctuary. And Casper was actually better behaved in the van than our dog was. And so it, it, to me, it just sort of it opened up the, those shutters of, you know, like this is an intelligent, loving creature. It's it's not this, this brain dead animal that, you know, you get told. And so, um, oh, sorry, I'm losing my point here. Um <laughs> What was the question again? It was uh, with... Um... How about the family? What are they thinking? Oh, yes, about the families, yeah. Um, and so during this whole process, we'd take photos and we'd put them up on Facebook. Uh, my mum, she would she would comment on them. And so with the upgrim, upbringing she'd, she'd given me and my brother and everything, uh, lamb was always one of the staples of a, of a roast dinner. She'd always comment, mmm, mint sauce on this picture of the sheep. And there's me like, mum, you know, I'm just having this whole... Uh, ethical sort of like journey type thing. I, I'm learning to love animals, not see them as meat, you know, and I wouldn't come and back. I would just sort of be like, okay, mom, you know, you go for it, you know, and just kept on with the mm, mint sauce, mm, mint sauce. Oh, that looks lovely. And she's gone vegan now. You know, we had those conversations and stuff. And while she, she was there at the start, you know, she was the one who taught me how to kill these animals, how to prepare these animals. But you know, through seeing me go through that journey and me not reacting back to it, you know, I could have got really grumpy with her for doing that. I was just like, no, you know, I know it's my mom. I know where she's come from. What she's taught me is what she's been taught to her. And so, yeah, that, that process has just helped her. And now she's, yeah, she's vegan herself. And it is so wonderful because it drives my brother nuts because now there's two, <laughs> two zealous vegans. But, you know, that's the thing anyone can have these shifts anyone can have these changes and so still working on my brother um i don't know how well that's gonna go <laughs> um but you know a lot of our family are a lot more open to it um my son-in-law you know he's getting a bit more sort of veg curious you know he doesn't want to say it he doesn't want to say it but you can see the little roots starting to grow there and we keep planting this seed you know we're sort of trying to pull that carnism one out species and yeah, have some have some compassion for you matey um but it's it's so lovely that you know it's another thing you just got to take your time just keep watering those seeds you know if they pull them out plant them again you know, we can do this. We can get rid of that carnism, that speciesism, all those horrible plants, and we can just bring it back to that whole compassion. And what I think is is it is is being truly authentic to ourselves. Because if when now that I'm, I feel I'm authentic to myself, I'm not wanting to kill. Uh, kill. I'm not wanting to butcher. That isn't part of me. That was all just the um, the ideals that being passed on to me. And, you know, in my case as well as being a, a male, you know, toxic masculinity. And that's not something I want to be part of anymore. I want to be me. I want to be Gareth. I'm not living in your garden. <laughs> Get me out of that garden. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, I love the stories. And, um, well, shoot, I see we're coming up on the end of the hour. Let us know where we can find you. And please subscribe if you're watching to our YouTube channel and Gareth's YouTube vegan FTA channel, right? Yeah. Your YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, you can just find us at vegan FTA. Um, currently I, I don't have any individual products, but keep an eye out for Gareth's skirt in the future. Um, 
hopefully there will be some things in the works soon. But um, yeah, Vegan FDA is the place to be, the place to meet our community, the place to be be there for the animals and join in in that, that voice. So uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all there, hopefully. Yeah, Heather already said signing up. So yes, <laughs> you Brilliant. Know, these, these, I mean, that's why we do this because we need each other, right? If we, mm. if we support each other, we're really growing this vegan movement. We don't want anyone to feel alone and we're here to help. Mm. So yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks everybody Wonderful. for watching. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to say one of the biggest things that we've learned over the last couple of years as an organization is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We can't make a vegan world alone. One person can't do it. So we have to do it together. So, yeah, thank you so much for having us on here because, yeah, collaboration is key if we want a compassionate world. Amen to that. And yes, so everyone reach out to us. We we love you all for everything you're doing for the animals on our planet, for your health, for, yes, for the world hunger here at We Did It and um, at Vegan FDA. We're very thankful for all of you all. And thank you for watching. Thank you, Gareth and your lovely wife, Jackie. Her, all the best to you all and everything you do. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Namaste, vegan, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>